Uh, I worked for the Binghamton Press and Sun Bulletin uh, for 17 years and covered health and environmental issues. Um, the Press and Sun Bulletin is a Gannett paper and uh, some of my stories would uh, often run in Ithaca and Elmira and other upstate Gannett stories, uh, uh, papers as well. Now, for many of those years, uh, natural gas development was just one of many stories that I covered and it was actually a minor story because natural gas development was such a small part of the state's economy um, over the years and uh, there was some conventional drilling out in western New York, uh, especially through the uh, 1990s. There was a little boom in the Trenton Black River formation, uh, but it was never really a big part, especially where I, in our coverage area, which is Broome County um, and uh, uh, Sh Shenango County and Tioga County. It was never a real big story, although it was, it was part of the story. And that changed in uh, 2008, when uh, it seemed like it was out of the blue for us. It actually wasn't out of the blue, but uh, a group of farmers got together in Deposit, New York, that's in uh, eastern Broome County, and they leased their land uh, to an energy company. They collectively pulled together the land in a land coalition um, and leased 50,000 acres for $110 million. And this opened everybody's eyes. Suddenly we knew that this was a story unlike any of the stories that we had seen before. Now I said this was out of the blue for us. Actually, if anybody that was involved with the natural gas industry had known for some time that this idea of unconventional uh, natural gas development had really turned things around, especially in Texas. Um, for years, uh, decades prior to 2008, um, the uh, Mitchell Oil and other companies were perfecting this uh, concept of high volume hydraulic fracturing and horizontal, horizontal drilling, which uh, opened up these shale reserves that were previously inaccessible. So, okay, well that was Texas. And um, there's a real, you know, Texas, they do a lot of oil and, and, and natural gas drilling has been part of their history and part of their legacy. And uh, how would that translate up into the Northeast? Well, Appalachia has had uh, natural gas drilling for some time, as I said, some places in Western New York have as well. But it was really a game changer when they could apply this idea of high volume hydraulic fracturing and unconventional drilling to uh, these formations like the Marcellus Shale in the Northeast. Now, there's some big differences and some logistical issues that I'm gonna start getting to in a li little while. Um, First, uh, people ask me often, uh, how do I feel about this, uh, this controversial issue of high, high volume hydro hydraulic fracturing. I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the exactly what that involves, although I'm going to expect that a lot of people might have heard about that before. But my view is I don't have any um, public view on the risks versus the rewards, because there's certainly risks to high volume hydraulic fracturing and the extraction industry. Um, look at coal, for example, that's a great example. Uh, there's a lot of risk with consuming it, there's a lot of risk with getting it out of the ground, there's a lot of rewards. And uh, do the risks outweigh the rewards? We don't know nearly as much about uh, this uh, high volume hydraulic fracturing um, and horizontal drilling as we do with some of the more conventional means. Um, do they outweigh the, the, the risk outweigh the rewards? Uh, I know both arguments very well, um, and, and as, as I said, I, that's not my decision. <coughs> However, there is something I feel very strongly about, and that's the transparency issue. And uh, the mineral extraction industry in general, and the uh, oil and gas industry in particular, has for a long time given a buy on transparency, where a lot of rules and regulations uh, apply to other industries and manufacturers about what they put into the ground or how they dispose of their waste. It doesn't apply to the oil and gas industry because of various exemptions and that traditionally this way it, it, it has been. Some of this is because we like cheap abundant energy in this country, we use a lot of it and sometimes we enjoy the benefits that it brings us as long as we don't have to look too closely from where it comes. And this whole shale gas um, bonanza now that is happening in the Northeast is forcing us to understand it a lot more and look much more closely at it. 
So sometimes my position on transparency, and I'm going to get into that a little bit more, uh, it puts me on the same side of the fence as the activist, as the anti-fracking activist. Um, and, and that is to look skeptically, skeptically at institutions <coughs> and concentrations of, of power and wealth. Okay, and that's, that's an old liberal media uh, definition, actually it goes all the way back to Joseph Pulitzer, and I have a separate lecture on that, and, and I won't get into that uh, right now. But just to talk a little bit more about specifically about fra uh, high volume fracturing and how it differs from conventional uh, uh, development, how many people here have a pretty good understanding of high volume <coughs> fracturing and horizontal drilling versus <coughs> conventional fra fracturing? Okay, uh, probably, so I'll, I'll, I won't spend a lot of time on it. <coughs> These are maps that you've probably seen by now. Um, they show the footprint of these shale plays. This is the Marcellus shale. The darker parts are the thicker parts and the more, more viable parts. And the, of course, the main difference between this and why we're hearing so much about it is the footprint is massive. Unlike your tr conventional uh, uh, gas extraction, which covers ge geographically limited pockets of area, little limited pockets, the footprint for shale gas is huge. This is the Marcellus. The sweet spot is the darker spot. This is the uh, fairway here, which is the most viable part. It extends up into upstate New York uh, through um, the southern tier area into the Catskills. And uh, that's the part, that's the sweet spot. So it's the part that's most economically viable for these companies to come in and do their exploration and start to build out the infrastructure. As they go on, the concept is it's an economy of scale. They start with the sweet spots and they build out. A lot of it has to do with the price of gas. Uh, in 2008, when the deposit farmers landed that huge deal, the price of natural gas was three times what it is now. So price of gas has naturally gone up and down and up and down. Um, it will probably continue to do that. There is some argument that is the uh, institution develops these markets for it, uh, converting coal plants into natural gas plants, using it more for fleet vehicles, uh, offshore, uh, exporting it possibly, the price will go back up. This is the Utica, uh, uh, sorry, this is the Marcellus, I'm going the wrong way. Here's the Utica shale, you haven't heard as much about that probably, it's underneath the Marcellus and uh, it's not, it hasn't been explored much in New York, they're starting to drill extensively into the Utica in Ohio where they're getting wet gas, the price of wet gas is higher now so that's been more incentive. And what's interesting about the Utica is it's more viable further upstate, so that includes this area. Okay, we don't have a lot of information, but it's underneath the Marcellus. The, as the Marcellus comes up to the surface in Marcellus, New York, where it outcrops, um, it's not very viable at all. It's too shallow, too thin. But the uh, Utica underneath it can be viable in areas where the Marcellus isn't. Um, so some of these areas where it's a little thicker, this doesn't show you the depth, it shows you the thickness. But up here is uh, where we are in New York State and over in Ohio, um, where it's an attractive target. Um, something else uh, that's, I think, very important for this area, and this is the idea of stacked horizons. A horizon is an area that they go to to drill for natural gas. And um, when they have the Marcellus stacked over the Utica, there's double incentives. So companies can go after it and if they're exploring one formation, they can drill a, another formation. And when you start putting the shale gas formations, principally the Marcellus and the Utica, and then sandwiched in between these, there's the Herkimer, there's the Trenton Black River, there's these other conventional formations, it makes it much more um, desirable for gas companies. Now, landmen, when they go to people's doors to lease their property, aren't going to be giving them all this information about all the wealth they're sitting on, okay? Because the gas companies do the geoseismic uh, testing on this. They spend a lot of money. It's typically private information. And when they go exploring it, it's like the old idea of uh, the, uh, you know, the <coughs> gold rush, okay? The people that know where the gold is, they're not going to be telling about, uh, a lot about it. Now, 
uh, as I said, uh, when the deposit farmers, they started understanding, that, well, by farmers I meant typically landowners, okay, the landowners that lived out in the country in, in no, uh, the southern tier of New York were the first to really get wise to this. And one reason was the landmen were starting to have a bidding war over their property. They wanted it a lot after the Pennsylvania part of the land play was proven. And the price of the leases went up so high that the farmers, they, they were having competing landmen and they knew something was up. So they started to get together and say, wait a minute, let's hold out and, and let's study this and figure out um, you know what's happening and that's when they started to understand long before many of the other long before the press certainly and a lot of, a lot of the other people started to understand the mainstream public that this conventional uh, this unconventional formation was really going to be uh, worth a lot of money and be a big deal so um, they the, the one group of farmers leased their land got a lot of money for it and it made everybody else say this is coming, this, this has potential in our area too. What is this? And everybody started then learning about the Marcellus. As a newspaper reporter, um, myself, my colleagues, we started reporting much more aggressively on this, following the story, and it became front page news pretty much on a daily basis. It became the story. And I was very fortunate to be in a position in New York State border where things started develop, developing very differently. You had Pennsylvania, where the land play first started, and a lot of people leased their land unwittingly to landowners. Um, and then you had New York State, where people were much the wiser, and you didn't have the infrastructure and the culture and the regulations in place to go ahead with it. So you had a really interesting vantage point uh, to see how this play unfolded on both sides. And New York State now has become a very uh, newsworthy state in the sense it's the only state in the country that sits over huge shale gas reserves that is not permitted and it's become the center of the anti-fracking movement and we're, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But there was a time before frack was a bad word and that was when the farmers and deposit and the media started learning about they were sitting over a gold wealth of, of shale gas they were thinking what's not to like about that? Gas is clean burning, uh, people can make a lot of money on it, we can have an industry here um, National independence, uh, you know, the war on Iraq was going on then, and, and other uh, the Afghanistan, and uh, so what was not to like about that? And um, one thing that before the anti-fracking movement came, uh, there was a lot of town officials and town folks in Broome County said, okay, we have something big here, how are we going to handle it? So really the anti-fracking movement started I call it the anti-fracking movement, but this movement of resistance started with town officials. And uh, they, after the deposit deal in the summer of 2008, towns and other areas started getting together and asking themselves, how are we going to regulate this? Uh, what about the roads? What about public safety? What about um, you know, hazardous waste? What about uh, you know, um, uh, fires and you know we don't know what's in this what is this so they turned to the state uh, the state department of environmental conservation they knew that the state was the main regulator for this the, the federal agencies doesn't uh, regulate this and they wanted they wanted to know answers so the state sent out representatives to these town meetings in, in the summer of 2008 in Broome County and I was covering these meetings and these meetings were fascinating because town halls would be standing room only um, they, they would be filling auditoriums, uh, everybody was in on it, they wanted to know what was going on, and the state officials were trying to answer the questions. So I'm going to read one passage that represents this uh, in 2008, how this all came down, because it's important to understand uh, how it's led to where we are now. And you'll have to bear with me uh, for a moment while I uh, try and Quick question while you're doing that. Is mm -hmm. Deposit in New York or in Yeah, Pennsylvania? Deposit is in New York, Broome County. Okay. So uh, they, they leased a, a big deal in Deposit, and this was uh, over a lucrative part, right? That's in Broome County. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about Pennsylvania in, in a bit. I'm sorry. Hmm.
Okay. So this meeting was in July, and there was several representatives. Some people uh, that I talk about in the book, it wasn't just the town's folks. There was the New York Farm Bureau was very interested in this. Uh, various attorneys, one by the name of Chris uh, Denton, an Amira attorney, very interesting character. Um, he got in very early on the uh, oil and gas leasing and the importance of owners to understand when they were signing a contract, uh, it wasn't just like they were having a lottery ticket. It wasn't all about just, oh, we have clean, abundant energy under our, our, our uh, land and we're going to be rich. He used to call it a, a, uh, a lease deal is a complex business transaction posing as a lottery ticket. So they were, went out and they started going buyer beware and other towns meetings, uh, town, towns folks started getting uh, involved with this as well. And this is one particular meeting where they were all in front of the New York State DEC and asking DEC representatives uh, questions. Uh, and the panel included a DEC rep, Farm Bureau rep, and somebody from the Susquehanna River Basin Commission. They sat in front of several hundred residents, sur suburbanites, farmers, and officials from the town, county, and state governments who packed the public hall beyond capacity. The meeting was also streamed online. Linda Collard, ran, she's a DEC representative, ran through a PowerPoint presentation of how Marcellus development would proceed using information and photographs from <coughs> conventional plays in upstate New York. She paused on a slide showing a lush meadow of wildflowers and grasses with a bank of trees in the background. This was a reclaimed natural gas site, she said, and an example of the expected long-term impact from Marcellus development. I recognize the slide from a DEC display two years earlier when I was covering public hearings on a proposal by the Office of Mineral Resources to lease mineral rights of state forests in the southern tier in central New York. Marcellus prospecting had yet to become a public phenomenon and there had been no mention of shale gas at those meetings. Nonetheless, prospects of any kind of drilling on state land drew fierce opposition from outdoor enthusiasts ranging from hunters to skiers. At these hearings, Jack Dow, director of the DEC Bureau of Oil and Gas Regulation, set up a display with his colleagues pitching clean, well-organized drill sites, including before and after landscape depictions. The display had included the photograph that Collard now showed, that now showed and Dow had given a similar assessment that the impacts from gas development due to the, quote, well-established regulatory program and, quote, rigorous permitting process of the agency would be minimal or even environmentally beneficial over the long haul. The crowd at the Shenango Town Hall was skeptical. People fired questions at the panel before college presentation was over. A person in back stood up and asked how local emergency responders could prepare for a spill, fire, or explosion when the industry did not fully disclose the complete chemical content and concentrations of the fracking fluids. Collard uh, looked at other members of the panel to see if anybody might want to take a crack at that one. They looked back at her expectantly. We don't anticipate any significant emergencies, she said after a pause. These things are rare. Another person stood up and asked how regulators were prepared for an influx of drilling that would exceed any historical comparisons. Collard responded, we've been doing fine so far, no problems. She returned to her PowerPoint and was interrupted again by a person who noted that incentives for roadside dumping would go up as waste increased faster than the options for treatment. How would the agency handle that? You have landowners out there, you have neighbors out there. We would hear about it, Collard said. Hopefully the operators will be responsible. More questions along the, the same lines followed her presentation and she delivered the same answers. Flowback is classified as an industrial waste and therefore requires a permit for transport, she said again. And again came a question, where does it go? I can't answer that, she said. It's all regulated, she added. So this was uh, the type of response that people were getting from DEC representatives and it made them skeptical and it got back, this was a, now a big story, the press uh, was reporting on this on a regular basis. After this particular meeting, I got a call from the governor's office along with other members of the press saying, the next meeting we have is there's going to be a change in the lineup with the DEC. Instead of the rank and file DEC, there's going to be some top level officials from Albany that will come and try to answer some of these questions. One of those people 
was Judith Ank. And Judith Ank, uh, for people that are interested in why New York is where it is now, is a very important figure. She was, uh, unlike a lot of the oil and mineral people who came up rank and file with the industry uh, as geologists or just working along, um, and, and there's a lot of back and forth with the industry, it's only natural. So, um, Ank was a environmental activist. She was with New York Public Research Interest Group. She worked with Governor Spitzer uh, when Spitzer was Attorney General as his uh, main uh, advisor when Spitzer became governor. He brought her on to become her main environmental, or his main environmental advisor. When Spitzer resigned amid the scandal, Ank stayed on and was Patterson's main advisor. And uh, she, again, her take on shale gas and all things environmental were quite a bit different from the rank and file of the DEC. So during the next meeting, that I was we were called to. This was up in Shenango County, and uh, it was in the town of Green, and this was in a school auditorium that probably held about 300 people in a very rural community, and um, it was again it was packed beyond capacity. And the uh, I won't read from the book, but just to summarize, there was uh, people there that put the same types of questions to the DEC. Who's going to regulate this? How do we know that the you know the roads are safe? Where's the waste going? What do they do? And Judith Ank got up and said, "You know what? These are all good questions. We need to answer these questions. I think you'll hold our feet to the fire uh, to answer these questions." And, and lo and behold, the public certainly did. Ank went back, worked with the staff, and then they came up with the drilling uh, the uh, the so-called moratorium on, on drilling. Really, it's a, an environmental review that's yet to be completed. Uh, back in 2008, uh, even the people that were for shale gas development in New York State, and Senator Tom Libis is a good example. He's a state senator down in Broome County. He's a conservative, he's a Republican, and he wants, he, he's all pro for gas because he thinks that it'll help stimulate the economy and that. Even he thought it was a good idea for New York State to slow down but they thought the review might take a year. So here we are four years later, and I'll talk a little bit more about where we're going in the status, but things have changed, and a lot of that has to do with this idea now that frack has become a bad word, and that has to do some with uh, Josh Fox's movie, which I'll talk about in a little bit, and, and some other factors. Um, now, Immediately after this meeting, and, and then uh, within two or three weeks, there was the moratorium, and everybody said, okay, we have to find out more about shale gas. They looked across to Pennsylvania to find out what was happening. And where they looked was Dimmick, Pennsylvania. Dimmick, Pennsylvania in Susquehanna County is right across the border from New York State. And uh, there was a lot of expectation. I had a lot of sources on both sides of the argument, and my sources, some were landowners, we're, we're all over this. They were following it very closely and they were saying, Wilbur, you got to get down to Dimmick, Pennsylvania and see the development down there. It's really going gangbusters. Uh, the hospitality industry is going, the construction industry is going, they're drilling, they're producing a lot of gas. So um, I began to cover that and uh, the landowners down there, when they were approached by the landmen, did not have the benefit that the the deposit landowners had. The deposit landowners saw there was a bidding war and by that time the cat was getting out of the bag that something big was going on. When the landmen came to Susquehanna County, nobody really knew about the worth that they were sitting on and they leased their land for $25 an hour, uh, $25 an acre, thinking nothing would come of it. Now after, uh, within months, they found out like, oh, holy cow, I can't believe I signed that lease, look what we're sitting on but they were still expectant and hopeful that the royalties would provide a lot of money for them. I'm going to read one more uh, little excerpt talking about how this, uh, this expectation unfolded. Okay, this is uh, a, a, from the perspective of various residents who would become very central to the book because this is told in a narrative. So it brings a lot of different people and, and shows how this unfolds from these various perspectives. So this is the folks down in Denver. 
From the laundry line in her side yard, Pat Fernelli had a sweeping view of the scene that would determine her future. Men and equipment had moved from the hill across the Burdick Creek Hollow to a fallow pasture directly below her house. In late September 2008, bulldozers cut through a field of blades with goldenrod to level a pad for Gesford Tree. The well would draw gas from under the adjoining Farnelli land and the family's mortgage depending on corresponding royalties. The derrick went up in early October, and soon the platform straddling the hole was busy with men in coveralls and hard hats who were lifting, swinging, and lowering pipes with hydraulics and heavy hardware hanging from chains. Shouts of men over machinery and generators carried up the valley, sometimes with the smell of heavy machinery and diesel exhaust. As word progressed, it was easy for Pat, Pat to believe that destiny was working in her favor. At schools, churches, and the Lockhart lunch counter in Gas Mart, the news of the landman and their promises was giving away to the excitement of wells producing millions of cubic feet per day from the Teal and Ely properties. There was also news of corresponding royalties. Crews were now busy building compressor stations and pipelines on the Teal land at fair compensation, she heard, and drilling two other wells along Carter Road. This is what Cabot $600 million in shale gas development looked like. The size and intensity of the operation, its manic focus and energy, were all directed at producing wealth, and Pat took comfort in knowing her 20 acres were locked into the equation. Even a drop of that wealth, $3,000 or $4,000 per month, would make things good for them. They could pay their mortgage, buy horses and other animals, and make a go at farming. Her oldest daughter was getting married that spring, and they would have enough for a nice wedding. Pat would no longer have to worry about making ends meet for six dependent children with, with Social Security, food stamps, and the lousy hours and low pay Martin was getting at the Flying J. Martin, uh, her husband, worked as a chef at, at the local diner there. The shouts from men over the drone, the diesel motors, and generators on October 8, 2008, a bright Wednesday morning, didn't sound peculiar to Pat. The crew had drilled to 2,000 feet, still several thousand feet above the Marcellus pay zone when they encountered a problem that brought the multi-million dollar operation to an inglorious stop. Debris from upper layers had fallen into the hole and jammed the drill. <coughs> the Devonian bedrock under Gusford 3 is covered by 400 feet of glacial till, unconsolidated stone and gravel known in the industry as overburden. Drilling through the till is like trying to bore through a gravel pile, and although there are techniques to deal with it, they are not foolproof. A drill that jammed somewhere in the overburden might have been less of a problem, but the Gesford crews had already worked through the till and were well into the gas bearing zone of bedrock above the Marcellus. Gas had begun flowing and the crews, left with an open, uncased hole, had no way to control it. The problem persisted throughout the fall. To Pat, it looked pretty much the same from day to day, with a round-the-clock procession of equipment and men. The yelling at the site might have been laced with a little more profanity than usual, she reflected in hindsight, but really there was no way for her to know the problem would soon amount to more than a lost piece of hardware. DEP inspectors, DEP, that's the Department of Environmental Protection, which is uh, Pennsylvania's counterpart to our DEC. DEP inspectors were also ignorant of the complications of Gasford 3 until an event on New Year's Day 2009 put them on notice. A blast echoed through the hills. A mile north of the Gesford well, concrete dust billowed from the ground and hung in the frigid air over the ruins of Norma Fiorentino's water well. Norma was having supper at her daughter Brenda's house with her, at her daughter Brenda's home with her daughter, grandchildren, and a great grandchild. She was feeling optimistic that this year would be better than the last. Brenda's chemo treatments, chemo treatments were keeping her cancer in check and her granddaughter was expecting a second child. With luck, she would buy some nice baby things with royalty payments. Now, upon her return home, she stood trying to fathom the gaping hole and the shattered remains of a massive, massive concrete slab once covering her well. A random act of violence? Who would want to blow up her, out, her well? She called 911. As a Springfield Volunteer Fire Department cordoned off Norma's yard with bright yellow caution tape, Cabot representatives arrived on the scene. They took some tests around her house and determined that any gas, if it was there, was not lingering. 
So this is a little bit of the first experiences uh, we began to uh, understand in New York. So this got press coverage, ob obviously. And then uh, later, Josh Fox um, also uh, started reporting on this, that things do go wrong. And uh, before I, I continue how that story panned out, I want to just talk a little bit about the history and the legacy of mineral extraction in New York versus New York State. because. The comfort level of mineral extraction is different down there than it is here. So when things go wrong, people tend to react a little differently. And one reason um, why is because people have lived with the extraction in the industry down in Pennsylvania for a long time. And the anthracite coal mines probably are the best example. They cover about six or seven counties uh, extending up through north, uh, northeastern Pennsylvania, up around the Scranton area or a little further north. And, uh, over the years, the coal industry has been huge in developing the economy, not just in Pennsylvania, but throughout the country. Uh, railroads were built, canals were dug, and entire industries built on the back of the Pennsylvania coal industry. Of course, it was not without disasters and not without a cost. Oh, by the way, a uh, little flashback. This is the slide that um, Linda Collard presented at the DEC meeting that's representing uh, um, uh, high volume hydraulic fracturing and that's a conventional well so then essentially the New York DEC made it look very innocent and people were quite skeptical of that okay I guess I don't have my two slides here on uh, on the mineral extraction I have one showing coal and one showing the Knox mining disaster the Knox mining disaster is a sensational disaster in late 1950s when coal companies ignored the orders of the DEP and mined right under the Susquehanna River. And they got so close to the bed of the river that the bed broke through and uh, the river essentially drained into the mine shafts. And they, there's this one uh, very dramatic picture of the uh, whirlpool uh, in, the, in the river as it drained down in the mine shaft. And 12 miners were, were killed. Um, and it was the beginning of the end uh, for lots of reasons of the coal industry. But the uh, coal industry employed about 150,000 people. Um, the mortality rate among workers was atrocious uh, for a long time. And of course, you have acid mine drainage, and you have um, you know, the, the, the town of Centralia is a famous town, maybe not so famous, I'm not sure if people heard of it, but a seam fire uh, caught under the town. The town is condemned and evacuated, and it's still burning today. It's off in the country, so if you drive through Centralia, You'll, you'll drive off on back roads and you'll see a ghost town essentially with steam coming up from the caverns. Um, the Drake oil fields were also, the modern petroleum industry was born in Pennsylvania with the Drake oil fields that's going back a century earlier in the in mid 1800s and that's where petroleum was discovered, discovered in western Pennsylvania and so there's quite a legacy with that as well as well as uh, environmental cost to it. That's uh, Norma Fiorentino's well, um, and you can't really see it. That this, this is a big cement um, cover that, where these are cinder blocks, and the cover is about 10 inches thick, and it was just uh, blown to smithereens. <coughs> now, we've heard a lot about fracking. Uh, what you hear, and that's the idea that these chemicals go into the ground and they're going to come up and contaminate water. And there's a lot of debate on that. Uh, there's much less debate, from, from my view, there's much less debate than there needs to be on some other things. And one is, fracking is also what happens when these chemicals are in route or mixed or stored or handled above the ground. And fracking is what happens with all this stuff when it pushes out of the ground and on a large scale needs to be handled and, and uh, uh, disposed of. So the industry would like to call this process fracking just what's under the ground because there's a lot less data that really would show compelling evidence that this stuff comes up through the ground from below from the bedrock. Um, although there's some argument about, on that, but the, the science, there's not a lot of science that shows that. They don't like to count fracking as when it goes on, on, in, into the hose above the well at 10,000 pounds per square inch and a coupling blows out. Okay, so there's, and, and when they do talk about that, they'll say, well, that's human error or it spills or these things happen to other industries as well. 
um, the risks we have to take. And I will just add, and a lot of times they compare it to the automobile industry or plane, or driving on a public road or flying at an airport and saying, look, we have progress, we have to accept risks. One thing that's very important, uh, the distinction there though, is when you go on a public road or drive a car, you accept a risk. You, you understand that you might get in an accident. Same thing with an airplane, you're accepting a risk. A lot of times with fracking, there's a hidden risk that people aren't accepting. It might be going on a neighbor's land and they have nothing to do with it or want nothing to do with it and they accept that risk. Um, <clears throat> now, methane migration, here's the other thing I think we should talk about, uh, and, and that's the idea of methane migration. Methane migration is not necessarily related to fracking, it's a function of drilling. So as I described in the book, when you drill holes down through the ground, you uh, can create conduits for uh, natural occurring methane and other natural occurring things to get around into places where they shouldn't be. The industry likes to say, well, it's naturally occurring, uh, it's in the ground, and it's not our fault because it happens anyways. And some types of methane migration occur on their own. There's instances of swamp gas or methane that happens in landfills uh, from decaying material. This is called biogenic methane. The methane that comes with natural gas uh, from rock formations deep in the ground is called thermogenic me methane, and there is a distinction. And uh, with the DEP, Norma Fiorentino's well, and a lot of the other problems associated with it, it's uh, the they have linked that to thermogenic methane, production gas, they call it, as opposed to swamp gas, although the industry likes to confuse the, confuse the issues. Now, one more quick, uh, I, I think this is very important, and it's been underreported. So we've heard about Norma Fiorentino as well. We hear a lot about fracking, but we haven't heard about this. Although Norma Wilson the first became the worst case of methane migration related to gas drilling in Pennsylvania and elsewhere, much of what officials knew about the dangers of methane migration they had learned years before from more costly instances. The Pennsylvania DEP Bureau of Oil and Gas Management has filed, had files on more than 50 other cases dating from the beginning of 2004 to the time Norma Well exploded. All involved dangerous and sometimes fatal accumulations of gas migrating from new or abandoned wells into enclosed spaces. They had happened before the shale gas rush became big news and they had gained relatively little attention. In 2004, DEP records documented the collection of gas in the basement of the Harper residence near several uh, gas wells being drilled by Snyder Brothers in Jefferson County, about 80 miles northeast of Pittsburgh. On March 5th, the furnace kicked on and an explosion leveled the house and killed Charles Harper his wife Dorothy, and their grandson, Bailey. A report by the Pittsburgh Ge Geological Society includes a photograph of the scene, a foundation covered by charred rubble and the shells of burnt out automobiles in the driveway. And this is a quote. Although it rarely makes headlines, damage or threats caused by gas migration is a common problem in western Pennsylvania, states the document. In July 2008, an explosion killed a resident of Marion County who tried to light a candle in the bathroom. The DEP record of the event, one paragraph long, states that the agency, quote unquote, became aware of the problem after the fatality, which it linked to gas migrating into the septic system from an old gas well with deteriorated casing. The DEP files also contain some cases noteworthy for what was unknown, or at least undocumented. And this is from the file. Unknown name, Armstrong County, Southwest Regional Office, 1999. House explosion, resulting in destruction of residents and one fatality. Investigation is not well documented. Origin slash mechanism of migration is an operating gas well. Pressurize, pressurization of casing. Status resolved. For every fatality in the DEP files, there are dozens of close calls, evacuations, injuries, and water problems. So I bring this up to this next part about transparency, which I talk a lot about, and this is the idea of why do, don't more people know about it, and why are the DEP files so sketchy? Why do we have one paragraph and not a lot is known? And a lot of this comes to the idea that the industry does not abide by the same reporting requirements. There's non-disclosure agreements, so a lot of times if you're, you own 50 acres and you have a well on your, a gas well on your property, you're, you're water suddenly goes bad. 
um, you get in touch with a gas company and they work it out with you, usually with money or other things depending on how you want to negotiate it, but most of the time it's up between the landowner and the, uh, and the gas company. Well, there's our Drake Oil Rush. I just had these a little out, out of uh, order, so. And there's the, my, oh, there's, there's, I'm sorry, I guess I do have it. So for those who want to see the, the vortex, that's what it looked like. It swallowed boats, didn't it? I, they put rail cars in there to clog it up. Mm. It possibly could have swallowed boats. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was big. Okay, this is the uh, records that I'm getting to. This just it shows the brief record that I cite in the book. Um, that does not translate well at all on the screen, but that's the photograph uh, of the bulletin of the Harper residence. Mm -hmm. And, um, okay. And, and then there's, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this transparency issue, because that's where I left off. Uh, there's certain, there's, and then I'll get into characters of the book and how this became a very big issue <coughs> from Norma Fiorentino's well and how it turned into uh, something much bigger than that. And I try not to take too much longer because I know people are probably going to have a lot of questions too. Um, why didn't I do this? I'll talk about the characters in the book and then at the very end I'll talk a little bit more about the technicalities about the exemptions that the industry has because I think that's important but I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. Okay, so Norma Fiorentino's well blew up and uh, you had people you know, reporting on this and people were, were saying, this wasn't part of the brochure, we thought it was you know, clean energy, uh, national independence, you know, the talking lines the industry gives. And the industry's res the re response to this was, this is not our fault. You can't prove it. Uh, we're, we're providing water to some neighbors, you know, because we want to be good neighbors ourselves. But there was never anything in black and white because of the burden of proof, as we just talked about with the non-disclosure and the agreements, the burden of proof is always with the landowner. So this gives the company a lot of leverage. So if you're going to prove that the company polluted your well or caused it to blow up, you, you're going to have to hire lawyers and if push comes to shove, take it to court and the burden of proof is on you and the industry can always say, well, there's methane seeps in this area and the wells sometimes go bad by themselves and it gets to be very difficult and complicated. So a couple people in Dimmick, uh, several people in particular, um, Victoria Schweitzer calls them accidental activists. And Victoria is a retired school teacher, uh, principal figure in the book. Uh, she uh, married uh, her, um, uh, married Jimmy Schweitzer. She's a newly, newlywed. They were building their contemporary dream home in this, what would become this gas field. And uh, she helped organize a lot of the other residents. Uh, Carters are second generation farmers. Uh, tried, they were hoping that the, uh, uh, Ron Carter worked in a factory for much of his life, Procter & Gamble, um, got laid off, had heart problems, and he was hoping that the royalties would pay for, for their retirement. Um, there's Norma Fiorentino, she's a widow, her husband was a plumber, and uh, so you have people across all various demographics and walks of life getting together and saying, we got to do something about this. So they, you know, talk to their congressmen, elected officials, and most of the time they were working against the tide because there was a pro-drilling sentiment for much of Pennsylvania um, as people were making a lot of money off it, the industry and also many landowners as well. And plus this whole idea of the tolerance level. People, you know, accepted the mineral extraction industry down there. So the book talks about their, their stories and, and how they eventually ended up making quite, quite a big uh, bit of difference. You have people on the other side of the story too. Uh, there's Dewey Decker, who is, uh, he was the coalition leader in deposit uh, and town supervisor. He's also a farmer um, and he was instrumental in organizing landowners for that $110 million deal. He's a pro-gas person and he makes the point, you know, if you want to be a global <laughs> citizen, we all like our gases. If we don't, it, it, you know, we, we like to consume it. Um, but where does it come from? And if it comes from some third world country or if it comes from Russia or some other place, think about what it's doing to the land and the people there. They're not even getting royalties for that. So he makes some, some pretty valid points. Um, this is Don Lockhart. He uh, owns the Lockhart Lunch Counter down in Pennsylvania. 
Um, he's been a town boy all his life. He, he is a gas mart, he's a restaurant. And he says, yeah, I'm in it for the money because I've worked hard all my life. And uh, you know, this is what my business is about. And he thinks that drilling is a good thing. I must say about Don and Dewey, um, they're open. I mean, a lot of people have closed their minds on both sides of this. And then one side won't have anything to do with the other. And uh, Don and Dewey aren't like that. I mean, they're, they're open for discussion. Uh, very interesting people in part, and they're part of the book. <clears throat> now, when I said that Victoria and Norma Fiorentino and the Carters and Ken Ely's in the book, Ken Ely's a quarryman, a heavy machine operator, and uh, he's way different from the Schweitzers, but he also was very optimistic about shale gas development. Things went wrong with him. He, he took on, he joined these accidental activists to take on the industry. Uh, the story unfolds uh, with push and shove, and one problem led to the other, and John Hanger, who's the secretary of the DEP, um, the highest ranking environmental official, came, got personally involved with it, and tried to hold Cabot accountable and make them build an $11 million pipe water line to deliver water to all these homes where the aquifer was ruined. And, um, and so the story talks about all the various pushback on that and it became a, a high profile battle. But something else came of it, the EPA got involved, the EPA now is doing a federal study, Dimmick's part of it, on what is the impact of fracking on groundwater. And Dimmick is a, a critical part of that study. Let's see. Um, Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about these exemptions and why they're important, and this is where the EPA comes in again. Uh, one thing that's unique about this industry is the federal government does not regulate it. Local governments have no say in it. It's the states that regulate it. So a lot of industries, for example, they have, have to go by federal regulations when it comes to uh, waste handling, waste disposal. Um, identifying you know what they're using in their processes etc and then uh, they also have to go by local zoning when they site a factory the industry doesn't have to do either one of those and traditionally has been exempt from that uh, the one exemption known as the Halliburton loophole have people heard of that oh, Halliburton yes. loophole? okay um, just to be a little more specific about it it's the exemption from the uh, Safe Drinking Water Act in, in, in 2005 it was put through with the Bush Cheney bill and it just made sure that the federal government has never had jurisdiction over gas drilling. But gas drilling now was a new animal. Gas drilling used to be very regional, uh, very localized. And so the federal government really <coughs> never felt the need to regulate it, unlike an IBM or other electro or electro electronics manufacturing or something else that can be anywhere. Um, with shale gas, the industry recognized that this is no longer a localized or regional thing. These are huge areas in this throughout the country. That's when they put this bill through to make sure that it would be exempt from um, the Safe Drinking Water Act because essentially this is a disclosure issue. Other industries, because of the Safe Drinking Water Act, if they put stuff into the ground, they have to uh, disclose what it is. And if they disclose what it is, it, under, it had, opens it up to all sorts of other regulations. The industry, the gas industry doesn't have to worry about that. And then when it comes out of the ground, there's hazardous waste handling that they're exempt from. Okay, other industry, when they're producing waste, if it goes by hazardous waste, then it's a very high bar in terms of what they can do with it and what they can't do with it. If it's an industrial waste, it's down here, it's they, you can just dispose of it using conventional means. And that, to me, is the main Achilles heel of this industry, is there's no regional planning, and they can just dispose of it through pretty ordinary ways. It goes back, in my view, back to the days of Love Canal and pre-regulatory issues when industries could pretty much do what they wanted with their waste. The gas drilling industry still has those exemptions. Um, the EPA study, though, uh, is important because that is undergoing, uh, the EPA announced that in 2010, and they're going to have a second look. and. Some people think that, depending on where the EPA study finds and how aggressive they are, that this might open the door to close the Halliburton loophole. Although I gotta say, there's a lot of political forces working against that right now. Obama has called shale gas a priority. Um, so you're not, not seeing a lot of cheerleading from the national level about people trying to close down these exemptions. 
local level is very also very important. Um, have people heard about the home rule debate? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this, I think, I'm excited about it uh, from a story, from a journalistic standpoint, because I think it's always important when people can get together and have it make a difference um, on a local level. And this can make a huge uh, difference. I've been following the grassroots aspect of the story, and it's, this is really, really where the story's at now. It's not about the overarching administration of this. It's about people coming up and making a difference. Now, the home rule debate gets back to that local issue about uh, localities saying we should have a right to say whether they can drill in our area or not and it should not be up to the state so Dryden and Middlefield are two towns that went ahead and they passed ordinances banning the industry and the industry and these are both over a potential shale gas reserves the industry said you can't do that it's against the law there's the state has legislated this and they have jurisdiction you don't so the industry took the towns to court and the industry has a lot of power a lot of legal wherewithal, the, the towns don't have as much. Lo and behold, the, the towns won in lower court. Uh, two, there's two separate decisions by the state Supreme Court, which is the lower court in New York, that said these towns do have a right over land use. Um, the industry appealed in the first appeals, which oral arguments were just made yesterday. Um, we'll have to see where that lands, but this is probably gonna go all the way up to the appellate division, and it really becomes a constitutional issue about uh, whether, you know, who has jurisdiction over land rights. Uh, very important. Now, this is really important in terms of, okay, well, you could say, if one little town is banning shale gas and it's developed all around it, uh, what difference does that make? Well, it's more than one little town. You have other towns that are opting out now or discovering that they have op opting out. And if you have a, a footprint the size of the Marcellus, one thing that's important about shale gas development is you need large contiguous areas for your build out. So if you have towns opting out and all of a sudden there's these holes in, in your plan, it really can disrupt things and it makes it's a big disincentive to develop. So um, the industry will say it's very important, we can't have home rule because it interrupts our plan. And the activists are saying exactly. Uh, that's exactly <laughs> what Pennsylvania, you have something else, which is the same concept of home rule. That's in Act 13, Pennsylvania legislature. Um, essentially, to make sure that uh, municipalities would not have a voice in this, they legislated it and gave uh, uh, municipalities very limited jurisdictions. And there are other things in that legislation, too. There was impact fees, uh, et cetera, as part of the whole bill. But uh, there's towns in Pennsylvania that have also challenged this, and this is also going to, and lower courts favored in, in, with the towns, this is also being appealed. That's uh, actually about a year old now, and it's uh, the Frack Tracker <laughs> website that starts showing, uh, color-coded, what it looks like when towns opt out. So you can see it becomes a very patchwork type of thing. Now some of these, the resistance are in, in towns uh, that are on the perimeter of the shale gas play, if you're talking about the Marcellus, but not necessarily the Utica. That's just a colorful graphic that shows the Marcellus, and again, some of the sweet spots are in red, the most lucrative areas, um, and some of the more viable areas extend out, out to the green. So with that, I will open it up for questions, and I thank you, thank you very much. Oh. Yes, um, I, I'm sure everyone else knows the answer to this, but if you are a household and you don't sell access to your property, can they still drill under your land? Uh, that's a very good question. question is, if I don't sell my mineral le lease, can they go under my land? And the idea is that technically, no, they cannot drill under your land. Now with conventional formations, uh, there's something called, well, with all natural resources, as a matter of fact, very interesting legal argument called law of capture. And the idea starts with a wild animal. And nobody owns a wild animal. It might be on your neighbor's land most of the time, but then it comes onto your land, you capture it, it's yours. Water is the same way. Water in a stream goes down through your neighbor's land, but it comes onto your land, it's yours. Same thing underground. 
if you can capture it, it's yours. With mineral resources, the law of capture applies. If you can get the technology to get it out of the, out of the ground, you drill something on your land, the natural gas gets sucked off from your neighbor's land, is still yours. So there's an incentive then for the neighbor to say, well, I don't want to lease my land, but I don't want my neighbor to get it, so I'm going to put a well on my land. Now, that's with conventional formations because they're porous and gas moves around like, more like water does. Shale gas is tight. It doesn't move around so much. And there's going to be a big debate about, okay, uh, you can't drill under my land. I mean, you can't drill under my land. You know, is there going to be subsurface trespass? Will, will companies be able to extract gas from under your land without drilling? Now, it gets a little more complicated. I'm going to talk about something on the surface, how they can manage this on the surface, because it's very hard to model exactly what happens under the ground. There's something called the drilling unit. So a drilling unit is a unit where the, the company goes to the DEC and says we're dividing up our parcel that's leased into these units for the purposes of royalty payment. Now, some people in the unit might say, I don't want to lease my land, I don't want to have anything to do with it. Well, they are folded into the unit by New York law, it's called compulsory integration. So if uh, I'm a drilling company and I go with the unit and I have 60% of that leased, the other people have to be included into the unit, even if they don't want um, natural gas development. So um, that, that then they're supposed to be compensated by the minimal amount in the unit. So with, with the Trenton Black River, the, poor, the old rules where gas moves around, well, the idea is that gas would be taken from under their property and they'd be compensated for it. It's going to be a different thing if and when shale gas gets here in terms of what's going to be decided by the courts because this will be challenged. Okay, th there's all sorts of challenges, but those are the, the fundamentals about <coughs> what happens when you don't want to be included. So I guess the short answer is, in New York State, if you don't want to be included, and all your neighbors want to be included, you're probably going to be folded into the, uh, in, into the unit, even if you, you don't want people on your land. They, you, they cannot force you to put a well on your land, but you'll have to be included in the unit. Okay. Is there a response that, that has been exercised in New York? Not with shale gas, okay, right, with, with conventional gas, with the old rules about, yes, so the shale gas will be a different idea. The companies are going to have to say, um, somebody will challenge whether they're actually drilling under their land or not. With the old, with the old way, they didn't have to, so they, it wasn't really open for challenge. But now somebody are going to say, how are you getting my gas under my land if you're not drilling under it? So then there's going to get into subsurface trespass and all sorts of more interesting legal arguments. Yes? Is is there um, is the fracking material? Is that is that getting any less less lethal, or is that changing in composition as the years the technology improves? It's hard to know. Um, the, the industry will say yes, and the industry will also say we recycle it. Uh, and, and there is this idea of closed loop drilling, where they instead of the open pits, they contain things uh, in sealed containers, these big tanks um, on site. They put berms around it and they handle it, but really it's a mystery because there's no statutory, statutory definition of what recycling really is. There's a great mystery about how much gets recycled, you know, do they take the brine out of it and leave the other stuff, uh, what exactly is in it, because of the non-disclosure, um, it's hard to know. So the industry will say, oh, we're clean, we're green, best practices, you'll hear about that, we're following best practices, and most recently there's been a board in Pennsylvania, they're talking about forming a board of independent people to make sure the industry follows best practices, uh, but it's a voluntary type of thing. Who would, who would be in charge of uh, forcing the companies to disclose what they're drilling with? Well, that would so get that, back to that your Halliburton loophole. Is that, that a federal or a state? Or? Uh, the, either one could do it. The states don't. The federal government, the, the Halliburton loophole is key because if the Halliburton mm -hmm. loophole did not exempt the industry, then all of a sudden the industry would be under federal regulations and they would have to comply like everybody else. So with that loophole there, it's left up to the states and the states, because there's no overarching federal regulation, they don't have to worry about it unless they want to. And so far, no states have wanted to deal with that. Um, Another way to look at it is once you have a federal regulation, the states, that's the minimum the states have to do. The states can do more than federal regulations, 
but that's that's the minimum they have to do. That's the floor. But there is no minimum because there's a loop, loophole for the drilling industry. So there's, there's this agreement that New York State's coming up with. There's, is there any mention to um, that, well, type of, that type of disclosure? No, there's not. It's mostly voluntary, and you'll hear about it. The la last I heard about it is that the industry would give the state DEC the information, but the DEC would not have to make that public. So if, as far as I'm concerned, if it's not public, it's not disclosed. Um, if you have one big agency handling the information to itself, that's not disclosure. So uh, there has been some talk. Um, we don't know what the, uh, this gets to the other thing about the moratorium. It's called the Supplemental Generic Environmental Impact, right? The ASCICE people have probably heard about that. Um, this is the environmental review that Judith Anks started. Um, where is that now? It's been going through various drafts. It has not been released, so we don't know exactly whether there, there could be. I don't think there is. Uh, I think people would be talking about it, or the state would be talking about it with various sources. But hypothetically, they could be saying, okay, in our final draft of the ESCICE, we are going to demand full, full and public disclosure about all things. Or we are going to demand, even though the federal agencies is exempt from the federal hazardous waste, we're going to demand that in New York State, if you're going to be produced flowback, it's going to go by uh, our, our waste, you know, the ha hazardous waste standards. It's going to be classified as hazardous waste. That could be in the final ESCICE, but I don't think it is based on what I'm hearing. But then again, we don't know what the status is. And Cuomo <coughs> now, you know, with all this political uh, pressure he's under from the anti-fracking movement and the low price of natural gas, it could turn into something where he says this is not viable in New York State. That would be quite an exceptional victory for the anti-fracking movement. So when would we know about this instead of just Going around and around. There's my other issue about disclosure with this. I think it's all fair and good that Governor Cuomo wants and the administrators want to take a long time with this. Uh, there's a scoping process. We're going to look at this and we think we should look at it over this period of time with this source of expertise and we'll put the parameters on what we're looking at. But they've given us none of that. They just said the Department of Health is doing a review and that's long overdue. So. The, the administration has lost its credibility in terms of delivering anything. The anti-fracking movement, though, that's a good thing. A every time it's delayed has been a good thing. And like I said, people thought this would be a year, and it would be a definite, finite process. Now it's been four and a half years, and it's a very open, undefinite process. Last week there was an announcement about an agreement in Ohio between so-called environmental groups and the fracking industry mm -hmm. where the groups would set standards and, you know, the, the industry would have approval. And it puzzled me because I don't see why the, why the groups would be doing that. I mean, even, even if it were perfectly safe, there's still, you're turning rural area into an industrial zone. <laughs> yeah, that's, I'm glad you brought that up, and that's a little bit about the idea of uh, disclosure and the, the, that group, by the way, I, 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 was gonna, I was hitting on that a little bit when I was talking about the idea of recycling and what is recycling and there's no regulations and the industry will do best practices. So getting back to that term best practices, these various environmental groups have said, we'll work with the industry to make sure they do it right and we'll give them the seal of approval if they do it right. But it's unregulated, it's voluntary. Now let me just note, that the environmental groups, the one that stood out in my mind was the Environmental Defense Fund, which is probably pretty center or maybe to the little, to the right, far to the right of like the Sierra Club or the environmental or the NRDC or some of the more uh, leftist environmental groups. Okay, you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So the Environmental Defense Fund isn't, a lot of people would say that's not really an environmental group or not an environmental group that represents my environmental interests. So, um, to answer your question, why would they do that? I could say that there's probably a good faith attempt, maybe, that uh, a practical attempt that some people with environmental concerns represented by these groups and these interests are saying, we need shale gas, it's being built out in the United States, we gotta do something. So, uh, we can't seem to get anywhere else. We're gonna at least try to work with the companies rather than fight against them. I mean, I think that's the rationale behind it. But again, note that 
this is the Environmental Defense Fund and various industries, and it doesn't necessarily represent the broader environmental movement. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Do you have any information on the, the pressure that the national, that the, the federal government is giving uh, the, the politicians and the leaders in New York State in support of this? I mean, you mentioned something about the you know, president saying this in support of it. Do you have any other, have you learned any other things from any other groups from the national government that support Yeah, them? I don't think uh, there's any real pressure because, you know, right now there's a glut in the market. So the price is so low, they're bringing all the shale gas online that the infrastructure can handle, the prices are going low. So I, I think Obama's letting the market do his thing. I don't think there's a real push from the federal government to open up New York State. I think the bigger question is if Andrew Cuomo has presidential aspirations and if the anti-regulatory mood of the country stays where it is, and who knows what can happen in, in four years, right? Um, but right now, say, suffice it to say, both Romney and Obama were not very different in terms of mineral extraction and shale gas. They, they weren't. And the company, they, they were both appealing to voters who are, by and large, in an anti-regulatory move. So uh, can Cuomo say no to shale gas without coming up with a viable alternative uh, and have presidential aspirations? That's a ways down the road. But I don't know, to answer your question, of any pressure from the federal government to open New York. Are there any uh, states that prohibit uh, fracking? Vermont, uh, but Vermont doesn't really have a huge gas reserve. So um, there's, I know of no states with a uh, substantial gas reserve underneath them that are prohibiting fracking. Um, I believe Maryland. Um, and there's some others that are developing around the fence or, or back and forth. So I won't say New York State is the only one, but New York State is certainly the one with the largest amount of shale gas resources under it. And there might be a few others. I'll have to do some homework on that question because it's a good one. I'll probably get asked at the end. I think Maryland comes to mind as the other state. Uh, back here. Yes. Um, I don't have chapter and verse, but France was one of the uh, most famous. Um, they came. Uh, there's a ban in France. I recently wrote about um, Northern Ireland. Interesting, the BBC was here in Pennsylvania and they came up to New York. I had the pleasure of sitting down with them for several hours with the crew talking about the ins and outs of fracking. They're undergoing just the very beginning of a shale gas discovery there, very much like in 2008 with the Pennsylvania people and the New York people. They didn't know what Marcellus was and that's happening in Northern Ireland right now. There's a substantial shale gas reserve. A company wants to exploit it and, and develop it. There's a difference though, and I'm learning this also in Australia, because Australia is a big mineral extraction country or continent. Um, but I, I'm learning that uh, the um, other countries don't get the, a lot of people don't own mineral rights in Northern Ireland, for example. So there's an incentive for them to develop their land, but they don't get the mineral rights we have in this country. So we have more of an incentive in this country than many others because people who own land own the mineral rights and they get the, the royalties from it. Uh, back here, yeah. A few days ago, a woman judge in Pennsylvania uh, lifted the veil of secrecy on these, uh, get, these uh, uh, gag orders that the uh, gas companies put on victims who have been wrong. Have you heard any more about that? All right, I think, um, let me just, this ringing the bell about, uh, there was, a, okay, there was a newspaper, and I think it was the Pittsburgh newspaper, that uh, had successfully won a court argument about uh, companies, this disclosure thing. Uh, remember I said, it's between you and the gas company to figure out, well, <coughs> To add to that, a lot of times when I take the gas company to court and I settle this one way or the other, um, it's a non-disclosure and the records are sealed. Mm -hmm. There was uh, two newspapers in Pennsylvania recently that got the court records unsealed from one of these cases involving water contamination. That's what I'm thinking about. That, that, okay. That's the only thing that rings, rings a bell with me. I heard that the judges that said that they could unseal all of that stuff. But I mean, that's right. Well, yeah, that very, he, he 
this might set a precedent for other newspapers, right? But you can bet the industry will, will be fighting, fighting it all the way. Okay, but uh, this was it had to do with disclosure about what, uh, when it, if you take it to court, what is available through court documents. Okay, now there is also Act 13, and this isn't a disclosure thing, it's a gag order. It was part of this Act 13 I was telling you about before with the, uh, with the home rule and the, uh, the um, impact fees. Part of that also, they legis the Pennsylvania legislature passed a law that said if uh, a doctor is treating a patient that has been <coughs> exposed to chemicals and they need to know what the patient was exposed to, they have to sign a uh, form from the, before the chemical company will give them the, that exposure information stating that they won't share that information with anybody. <laughs> and, and this is the type of, this is how aggressively the companies are guarding their recipes. Okay, that tells you what's on the line. Yes? If the doctor signs a non-disclosure and then say, say I go in and I have something that's a result of this process, and then I get referred on to, say, an oncologist or something. Can they share that information with the oncologist? Or yeah, I don't know the practical limitations of that and how enforceable that is. I think that if I'm a doctor in Pennsylvania, I'm going to be fighting that tooth and nail, and I'll be going ahead and doing what I need to do and say, okay, take me to court. But uh, I, I don't know the, the practical implications of that. Yes, ma'am. I was wondering, if this is as bad as it sounds, why isn't Ohio a wasteland? Ohio, they're just it starting. Is. Ohio is uh, behind Pennsylvania. Um, and let me give you some perspective on that. Pennsylvania uh, has maybe six to 7,000 uh, shale gas wells now. If it's built out to its potential, it would have about 70,000 to 80,000. So Pennsylvania is just starting. Ohio started after uh, this became big, just about 2010 is when the uh, Chesapeake started exploring Ohio. So they're just beginning. Now, I know, but where is all the pollution and the death and everything else that everybody talks about? It's we there. Don't hear it. It's there. A Where few Ohio? cases here and there of an accident, yes. Right. I understand that, but I mean, if it is as bad as it's supposed to be, why isn't it more widespread? I'm not sure what you mean by supposed to be, but it's... Well, everybody says that all our water is going to be poisoned and all our trees are going to I don't to hear die. everybody saying that, man. As a matter of fact, I hear voices on both sides. I hear people saying, this is uh, causing pollution. I hear other people saying, there's never been a problem. No problems at all. So I I'm hearing a lot of different things, but I'm not hearing everybody say any one particular thing. Um, but to answer the question about Ohio, it's just starting in Ohio. There is an issue about injection wells because they're taking some blowback <coughs> from other things uh, and doing injection. In, and there's other issues about how we're going to handle the flowback and, and the, the waste over the long haul. And every, every state has a different process. Aren't there some earthquakes in Ohio? There's earthquakes related to the injection wells, injection. yes. Not to fracking, but to the injection wells. And that has raised a lot of uh, concern. Um, I wanted to go back to that lady's question about being able to take uh, gas if you haven't signed a, a lease for it. With horizontal extraction, for example, if I've, I have a well drilled on my property and they go down and they go horizontal and they go out several hundred feet or a thousand feet, whatever they do, and you're my neighbor, they can take that gas from underneath your land through that horizontal extraction. Yeah, the question is, uh, can they drill under your land? As well, said, you're drilling straight down and then they're going out horizontally. Right, but there's limits in terms of, they're, they're very uh, regulated in terms of where that horizontal border is. Okay, so they can't just drill as far as they want without having it all parceled off in these, these drilling units that I'm talking about. It all has to be documented. The question but is... the drilling units are huge, aren't they? Yeah. Some are bigger than others, yes. So, uh, and this it goes back to the 2008 regulation when we had the moratorium. There's this idea that was uh, spacing units. And the conventional spacing units for the conventional wells 
did not fit the Marcellus spacing units were, were much different dimensions. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea of, yes, the spacing units would look different, and the area that was drained within a certain area would look different. But that, it's just not willy-nilly. I mean, when they go out horizontally, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it has to be documented in terms of how far they go, how far they are apart, and where they Does are. Does that vary from state to state? Um, I, I don't know the answer to that. I know in New York State that there's 640 uh, acre units, mm -hmm. which are, are typical shale gas. Yeah. But I, I can say that the pads and the units, in the tech, as the technology changes, they're getting bigger. So uh, they can go out more than a mile now before the, a mile was. Exactly. So I, I think common sense tells us you know, that they'll regulate that as the process continues to evolve. And they should. I mean, as industry evolves and technology evolves, regulations will change. Did you say anything in your book about the vast amounts of, of uh, potable water that's used in yes. this process? Um, you want to speak to that? Yeah, there's um, conventional wells use uh, less than you know, maybe 70,000 gallons. A shale gas well uses four to five million gallons mm -hmm. per frack. Per frack. Um, there's a question with drought in particular, mm -hmm. what this does to water resources. Um, and drawdowns, you know, uh, acute drawdowns. And then there's the idea of the, you know, the chronic thing over 10 or 15 or 20 years. All this has to be accounted for and planned. The DEC <coughs> and the regulatory agencies will say that they're looking at all these various things. So, um, but, but it's, again, it's just another example of where shale gas development is much different from conventional development because shale gas development is water intensive, much more water intensive. And in the Southwest, that's a, that's a huge issue. Yeah, and Texas in the my Shale. question to play, play, play places in Texas is you know, how are you doing it down there? Yeah, and the right. answer was that some areas are more drought sensitive and there are issues more so than others. It might be seasonal or, or whatever. So there are issues, but it's not across the board issues down there. And I think that would be the case here. I already in 2008, 2009 with drilling boom in Pennsylvania, it was a dry, 2008 was a dry right. summer. Mm -hmm. You had Dunkard Creek, which is a massive fish mm -hmm. kill. A lot of people will say, well, it was acid mine drainage or it was this, but the long and short of it is that the, the rivers were drawn down, the tributaries, mm -hmm. to the extent by the gas industry, there's no argument about that, and made it much more sensitive to uh, TDS fluctuations and other fluctuations where they tripped tripped over the threshold, a lot, a lot of fish died in Dunkard Creek, that's just an example. Um, so the long-term ecological balance of all these things, the salts in the water, mm -hmm. you know, the water levels, all these things, um, I think have to be done on a regional planning basis. And you do really don't see that traditionally with the gas extraction. Well, all that water that, that's used is never portable again. I have never, they say they can recycle it, but I've never seen yeah. it recycle. I've never seen anybody drink any, and no. I've seen it. Right. Okay, yeah. Um, the town of Painted Post, south of here in Steuben County, was selling water uh, for, for fracking operations in Pennsylvania. And yesterday, a judge ruled that it had to stop. <coughs> That's interesting. Was it a local judge or a state? I Oops. think he was in Rochester. Mm -hmm. District judge? Yeah, I can't remember. I read the article, but I can't remember. I'll have to look that one up. And what do you remember the reasoning? They somebody, I, I guess somebody challenged them. Oh yes. Oh yeah. They didn't, they didn't use the proper procedure. Okay. The procedures weren't followed. Right. Yeah. That's right. It it's interesting that the mood in New York State you're having. Although I must say it's very interesting. The Home Rule uh, uh, case in, in Pennsylvania also went with local municipalities. Mm -hmm. But so far, the courts have uh, have been siding with the municipalities and some of the environmental movements. Um, is you know, I'm, we'll have to see how it plays out. I think it's still very early.